Hello everyone, my name is Rebecca, and today I'm going to be developing ideas for my fairy world. If you've been watching my channel for a while, you most likely know that I've been developing a story and world for my character Pariah. In a previous video, I made a villain for the story, and now I want to design some evil minions that work with him towards his goal. Before creating the minions, I also want to do a bit of brainstorming for the star fairies, as they are going to play a big role when it comes to some of the lore. I do want to mention that this video is going to be focusing more on rough ideas and concepts, so all of the art is going to be more sketchy and simple. Don't expect any super detailed illustrations for this video. Before jumping into drawing, I made an inspiration board to help inspire me and brainstorm ideas. These are always super helpful. Like all my other inspiration boards, I made this one in Milanote, and they are the sponsors of this video. Milanote is a tool for organizing creative projects, and I use it all the time to help me plan out my fairy story. It works very well for me because it allows me to organize ideas visually in a way that makes sense to me. I can easily drag things around and also write in notes if I want to jot something down really quick. I have several boards in Milanote related to my fairy story, like the character profile board. For this board, I actually used one of the over 100 built-in templates to help me have a starting point and something to work off of. It was super helpful and made the process much quicker. Milanote is perfect for creative projects, but it's also super versatile and can be used for many things. Like, I also use it to help me with everyday things like track my Christmas shopping and present ideas. <laughs> Plus, Milanote is available for free with no time limit, which is super awesome. You can sign up for a free Milanote account using the link in the description. Thank you so much again to Milanote for sponsoring this video, and let's jump into drawing. So, like I mentioned, I wanted to get some ideas out of my head for the Star Fairies. I'm still trying to decide on an official name for them. A few of you suggested calling them Starlings, and my brain keeps gravitating towards that name, so I'm going to call them Starlings for now, but it may be subject to change. Something I've decided is that I want to break the Starlings up into more magical types. I have two that I need at the moment, and I may make more magical factions if needed. The first magical group is the messengers. These are the ones that are the most common types. And Malachi belongs to this group. They are able to create messages and send them via shooting star. I've decided that their key features are their horns, and I'm going to remove the star mark from their forehead. Uh, but don't worry, some starlings will still have this mark. Uh, it's just that the messengers no longer will. Something else I wanted to take note of is that the horns on messengers' heads get larger with age. This allows them to send longer and more complex messages, but they can also send them a further distance. So like for example, since Malachi is still young, he can't send messages super far, so sometimes he still has to travel to like different outposts and then send a message from there. The second magical faction will be the healers. As the name suggests, healers have healing magic and their defining characteristic is the star on their forehead. Healers are very rare, so their magical abilities are usually highly sought after. There used to be many healers a long time ago, but now very few, if any, still exist. Something else I wanted to work out is the skin tone range of the starlings. In my head, they can be many colors, but I did want to limit the color range. For the most part, the colors range from blue to purple, but this range can also go all the way to white and yellow, and of course they can have lighter and darker variations. I did also consider including black in this lineup because the night sky is very dark. However, I think if I do use black for a starling, it is going to be a rare case, like maybe a super powerful starling or something. It's not going to be a common color. Next, I want to get a rough idea for the ancient starling city. The ancient starlings were very powerful and had great knowledge. They had a huge city with a part that floated in the sky. The closer that starlings are to the cosmic energy of space, the more powerful their magic is. The floating island was created with parts of a meteorite that came from space. Because of its celestial properties, the starlings can work with it in many ways. Uh, so yeah, the Starlings were a great and powerful group. However, they strived for even more power, and because of this, a tragic event happened. And they lost everything and became scattered. This part of their lore goes much deeper in my head, but I'm going to keep it kind of vague for now. With the Starlings scattered and their city lost, they became nomads. In hopes to store their knowledge for future generations, some Starlings created strongholds that contained Starling knowledge and artifacts and remnants of the old city. Some of the things I drew here are an information containment device. Star messages usually don't last for too long, however they can be maintained with the aid of magic. The second thing I drew is a statue that depicts one of the ancients. 
I wanted them to look cool and mysterious, so I went with a cloak and very drapey clothes. Lastly, I wanted to make a note for my future self that many of the ruins are found in mountains. Since starlings prefer higher elevations that are closer to space, I imagine many of them would live on hills or mountains, or maybe even up in super tall trees. So yeah, those are all my random thoughts that I wanted to get out of my head in regards to the starlings. It's kind of funny because Malachi was just a random character I made for a Space OC challenge and I randomly decided to put him in my fairy story and now it's like super important for the lore. <laughs> also, you may have noticed these two characters in the footage. They aren't really important or anything. I've just been enjoying drawing what I call NPC characters. They are characters that might be in the background or play a small role, uh, but they're not going to be like major characters or anything. Now let's move on to Koru and his legion. In case you don't know, this is Koru. He's the villain of the story. He grows a laurel daughter type plant. It is a parasitic plant that wraps around its host and takes nutrients from it. He has a magical stone that greatly amplifies his powers, changes his physical characteristics, as well as characteristics about his plant. So that is your quick overview of Koru. Now let's design some of his henchmen, so to speak. <laughs> Oh, also, since I am making an evil army, some of the ideas I discuss here will be on the slightly darker side, just as a pre-warning. The first plant we will be designing a fairy to go along with is the Bruccini Reducta. This plant has a carnivorous nature. Its waxy coating on its leaves help trap insects. The trapped insects eventually drown in the water collected in the plant's rosette. The water in the cup emits a sweet odor to lure insects, and it may also contain digestive enzymes. Long story short, the plant makes a cup of water that bugs have a hard time getting out of. <laughs> I drew two variations of the plant based on some pictures that I found. The first one is most likely one that has been grown as more of a house plant, and the second one seems to be one found more in the wild. So because these fairies are going to be helping Koru, I wanted them to look very menacing compared to normal fairies. But then I started thinking, why would these fairies look evil simply because they are on Koru's side? Like, I wanted a logical reason for them to look more menacing. Um, so I kind of just started by designing a quote-unquote normal fairy. Maybe this fairy is a part of a carnivorous tribe. For the most part, many fairies are herbivores. They eat mostly things that come from the plants that they grow, like fruit, vegetables, nuts, and some animal products like small bird eggs. Some fairies keep birds as trained pets that they ride, but they can also collect and use their eggs. Even small bird eggs are pretty large to fairies, so they don't need many eggs to be able to put them to a lot of use. However, there are groups of fairies that are naturally more drawn to eat things like insects and the meat of small animals like mice. I imagine they cook the insects or meat and make various meals and use their plants as hunting traps. For this fairy, I imagine she just grows the trap and maybe her father handles the rest. <laughs> so this Puccini Reducta grower doesn't really look like a villain even though their plant can be seen as a bit gruesome. So now I was trying to figure out how to make a Bruccini Reducta grower that does look like they work with a villain. And then an idea hit me. Remember how I mentioned that the magical stone that Koru has changes his physical appearance and all that jazz? Well, my idea is that the minions are given smaller stones that also amplify their powers, and their appearance does end up changing as a result. The idea of fairies receiving the smaller power stones in exchange for working with Koru kind of plays two parts. Of course, it makes them look more menacing and evil for the story, but it also gives these fairies a reason to want to follow Koru. They yearn for this extra power that they are being promised. However, there is a cost to this extra power if they are not careful. This first minion design is a more tame transformation. She gets the darker sclera like Koru. I also leaned into the carnivorous theme by giving her sharp, more noticeable fangs and also claws. Because her magical capabilities have increased, she now also has an unnatural skin tone and her ears are longer. For context, fairies with higher magical capabilities like the Royas have unnatural skin tones and larger ears can also be a characteristic of magical capacity. Oh, and for this design, I have the colors based off of the second plant version since they seem to better fit the vibe. So here is our first minion who looks different from an average fairy. But let's see how we can push this transformation further. The second character is going to be a part of a group that I don't talk about very often being the Mer Fairies. 
And I'm not sure how big of a role they will play in the story, but they grow aquatic plants. Of course, they are different from the standard fairies because they have tails, but they also have fin-like ears. The mermaids don't have the possibilities of getting wings like the land fairies do, but royal mer fairies do get larger tail fins and more majestic tails. This particular mermaid grows the plant known as the bladderwort. Isn't that a lovely name? <laughs> The bladderwort is another carnivorous plant. These plants have small bladder-like traps that use a vacuum mechanism to capture prey. This plant does have variants that can live out of water, but this one thrives in aquatic settings. Just like the land carnivorous fairies, the mer fairies that are carnivorous use their plants as traps for food. So here's the standard bladderwort mer fairy. For its transformation, we are going to take it a step above the previous one. She is going to lose some of her human-like characteristics and start resembling her plant a bit more. Bladderworts have these parts that branch off and I decided to use these as a form of kind of tentacle. So she no longer has her tail, but she resembles more of like an octopus. I'm going to also make her overall build more long and slender to kind of match the long stem of the plant. Her hands will also start turning into long, almost root-like structures to kind of resemble this part of the plant. To make her appear even more monster-like, she loses her irises and her eyes are now just black voids. Her hair has also transformed into flower petals. My thought as to why this transformation happens is related to how the fairies rely on the plants they grow. You see, fairies have to use some of their magic to grow plants, and this magic comes from their life energy that I named Zoe. When fairies grow plants, the plants also let off Zoe, even more so than what the fairy had invested, and the fairies are able to kind of absorb the Zoe that comes off the plants. Well, so when these average fairies have their Zoe capacity all of a sudden increased drastically, I imagine it probably makes almost a hunger sensation, and it's a hunger that possibly can't be satisfied. In attempts to satisfy this hunger, the fairy relies more and more on the zoe from their plant, instead of waiting for the zoe to recharge with time and rest. This high reliance on the plant and its zoe energy, along with the non-zoe magic thrown in by the magical stone, causes the fairy to take on characteristics of their plant they start to lose themselves to the plant. So this last fairy grows corpse flowers. These flowers are very smelly. It uses the smell to attract bugs. In real life, it attracts bugs for pollination. However, in the fairy world, pollination doesn't exist since the fairies handle plant regrowth and all that stuff. So the bugs are attracted to the flowers for hunting purposes. The bugs come to the flowers and then the fairies trap them. I made the fairy for this plant very big since the corpse flower is huge. They can grow up to be 3 feet. For some reason I also wanted to have this fairy be a pretty chill guy. In my head he is a father to many children and he does all that he can to provide for them. However when times get hard he turns to Koru and his power for help. For this design we are going into the final stage of the uh, evolution process I guess. <laughs> At this point the fairy kind of no longer exists. They are now just a beast that yearns to fill their zoi energy. They are now one of their plant without a will of their own. You might notice I will not include a magical stone for this design. That is because I'm contemplating with the idea that maybe at this point the stone also becomes one with its wearer. Or maybe for a fairy to reach this point they have to ingest their stone. My thought is maybe the fairies become so desperate to fill this hunger that they have that in this crazed state they end up eating the stone in hopes that it will cure it but then the stone is able to completely take over. I would have to see if this idea fits in okay lore-wise and with the rest of the story, so it may or may not stay. Now you might be wondering, Becca, these horrible things are happening to these fairies. What about Koru? Why isn't he one with his plant? Especially since he wears a very large gem. Well, my answer to that is Koru already had a decently high magical capacity before using the magical stone. I'm still trying to decide, but before he was evil, he was either a Roya or a Demi Roya. Also, Koru is very smart and is strong willed. This helps him to not be consumed by the thirst for power or the hunger, uh, like the average fairies. This being said, time is getting to him and he is slowly losing himself. Also, I hope I don't spoil too much for all of you when it comes to the story. I try my best to avoid anything that's too related to the plot and try to go into things that are more general or just kind of world related. Uh, so yeah, 
I hope I'm not spoiling things too much for all of you. <laughs> I do have to say it was very interesting working on the darker side of Pariah's world. I tend to spend a lot more time thinking about Pariah and all of the good guy characters. So thinking about the other side was an interesting change of pace, but also very fun. Developing the bad guys is just as important as developing the good guys, since they are both very important parts to the world and its story. They are two halves of the same coin, so to speak. It was also just really nice working on stuff related to Pariah's story again. With all of the blood clot stuff and me being pregnant, I haven't had the mental capacity to think about it as much recently. So it was really nice to sit down and get some rough concepts worked out. So here are all the different concept arts for this video. I hope you enjoyed listening to me ramble on about Pariah's universe and that you found it interesting. Also, if you know of any cool or interesting plants, let me know about them down in the comments. I'm always keeping my eye out for cool and unique plants to turn into characters. Before we end, I want to say a super big thank you to my awesome YouTube members and Patreon patrons for their support. It means so much to me. And thank you for watching this video, and I'll see you all in my next video. Bye!